All right. Well, uh, we can, in fact, get started. Uh, I'm happy for everybody to turn out, which is progressively becoming colder and colder here in Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, I'm all still relatively mild, so I'm surprised that I can still walk outside and perhaps not die of hypothermia within five minutes, uh, which is a good thing, which is a good thing. Now, um, I'm incredibly excited for tonight's event, uh, but before I get that, uh, I have to at least acknowledge a lot of people who have made this possible today. Uh, first off, we are able to do this with the generous funding of the Institute for Humane Studies, uh, and they of course are, are able to do this largely through the funding that they get from the John Huffington Foundation, and as a part of this funding, what we'll have to do um, is put out these uh, surveys. Uh, IHS just wants you to know, or wants to know generally, how you think this panel went, uh, and if you found it was truly an excellent panel, which I'm, I'm sure you will. Uh, the good news is, is that it is incentivized. Uh, one of the people will be a lucky winner, uh, and you find this out online if you give a valid email address, a, I think, $10 gift card to Amazon. We've had people win it here before, obviously. Uh, it is very real. So please fill out these surveys. <laughs> Uh, and it, there is a small, small carrot. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Bruce Reed, UMD here, for the very excellent tech work. Uh, as you can see, this is a little bit more tech heavy. Uh, we were able to get Bob Frank through technological means, and it's been very complicated, and Bruce has been very helpful. So I'm very appreciative of that. Um, also, I'd like to um, thank Bridget Park, who's not here. Uh, she is the secretary of the philosophy department. She's also been very helpful in communicating with the panelists, and communicating with me, and also services. And she, if anything, is uh, essential to this whole process. I'd also like to thank my uh, TAs, Tyler England back there, Megan Emery back there, uh, who are gracious enough to work not only for free, but to pay me to work. So, <laughs> probably a bad business model, but... Yeah, thank you. Nonetheless, I'm happy to exploit you. Um, now, uh, a little bit about tonight, and I'm not going to spend too much time um, because we have panelists who are going to introduce the issue and do so in a much more sort of, how would you say, uh, enlightened way than I could. That's why they're the panelists and I'm not. Um, but I do think that this topic has captured the popular con consciousness in such a way uh, that pretty much everybody knows at least a little bit about it in the sense that they're somewhat interested in it. Uh, so I'm sure you guys have heard of the Occupy movement, right? I'm sure you've heard of the 99 versus the 1%, right? It's in movies, uh, whether it be Inequality for All, right? or whether it be, say, uh, as diverse as the comedy, what was it, uh, Will Ferrell's Other Guys, if you look at the credits of that, it's in there too. Uh, there is an overriding sort of concern about this issue. Well, we're during an election year, right? Candidates are definitely talking about it. Uh, President Obama thinks this is the defining issue of our generation, at least that's what he says. Uh, also, uh, we have, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, who's making a sort of an essential thing of his particular candidacy. Uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, is also mentioning it. In fact, candidates from pretty much both sides of the aisles have to at least pay some attention to this issue. Uh, that's how much it is important. Now, you may ask, if, if so many people are paying attention to this, why is the center wanting to weigh in on this? And it's part of the center's mission to provide, how would you say, more, I don't want to say enlightened conversation, but more in-depth conversation from a diversity of perspectives, right? So, what you'll often find on many campuses, uh, not just here at UMD, but I think across the country, are various sorts of talks or public lectures where you'll have somebody pushing a particular side of the issue, right? And it'll come off much more at times like a rally. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing per se, but it's just not what we do at the center. The goal here with the center is always to try to get as many perspectives as we can to the table, uh, and to have them discuss it in front of you, and to have you get a chance to ask questions. Uh, the reason being here is not to convert anybody to different points of view, but to get you to at least sort of see somebody from a different side and to start at least recognizing the power of other arguments. Arguments that you may have never considered for views that you may have considered to be radically different from your own. Uh, so I don't want this to be a, a series of talking heads. We have plenty of time to discuss this. Uh, so feel free if you don't think the candidates are giving you the answers you'd like, feel free to press them. Right, as the other panelists will press them as well. Um, so let me introduce our panelists. Right, uh, so Joshua Price, 
There you go, I missed it up before. Uh, he is an associate professor and director of the philosophy, politics, and economics program at Mankato, right, Minnesota State University, Mankato. He published in a broad variety of areas, um, particularly the journals, all the right journals to be in, Public Affairs Quarterly, Ethics, Business Ethics, <coughs> Quarterly Social Theory and Practice, Rest Publica, the European Journal of Philosophy, and the Critical Review of International Social and Political Philosophy. Um, we're very excited to have him, a Minnesota person. Yes, he's used to this. Very good. Um, we also have uh, Professor Nikolai Wenzel. Right? Uh, and is it Flamer College that you're at now? I know you switched his mind. Good, good, good. Um, now, you have, of course, worked in, in various you know, Washington, D.C. area think tanks, some of them including, of course, the Atlas. Uh, Economic Research Foundation, the Mercatus Center, and of course the Institute for Humane Studies. Right? Uh, and of course, he's been published in over a dozen journals, including of course the Review of Austrian Economics, uh, the Journal of Private Enterprise, and the Oxford Handbook of Sociology of Religion. Uh, and again, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, professor Stephen Horowitz right? uh, is a professor of economics at St. Lawrence University. Uh, he, of course, is the author of now, I think, at least three books. I mean, you just had one recently come out. Um, so the ones that have been out, Micro Foundations and Macroeconomics and Austrian Perspective, that's from Rutledge in 2000. Uh, Monetary Evolution, Free Banking and Economic Order, that's from Westview in 1992. Um, he, of course, is also the author of numerous uh, op-eds. Uh, he's a frequent guest on TV and radio programs in particular, and one of the reasons why I invited him here is because it's so good. Um, the popular YouTube videos from Learn Liberty, which is also from uh, IHS. Uh, excellent videos, I encourage you all to look at Learn Liberty well-produced, and Steve has a really good video set on there. Uh, his latest book is on Hayek and the Family and Classical Liberalism, uh, and it's Palgrave Macmillan, where he got published, right? and just recently, too. Um, and of course, coming to us uh, over the video feed, I believe it's on WebEx, right, uh, is Professor Bob Frank. Uh, he was originally going to be here in person, but of course, an injury took him down, but he didn't take him out of the game, so he is able to participate here uh, electronically which is excellent. Uh, he, of course, is Professor of Economics at Cornell Johnson's Graduate School of Management. Um, he, his economic view column appears monthly in the New York Times. Uh, his papers have appeared, of course, in the American Economic Review, uh, Economicrica, a journal of political economy, and of course, many other leading professional journals. His books, and there are a lot of them, uh, include Choosing the Right Pawn, Passions Within Reason, Microeconomics and Behavior, Principle of Economics, which he wrote with Ben Bernanke, um, luxury Fever, What Price, The High Moral Ground, Falling Behind, The Economic Naturalist, The Darwin Economy, and Success and Luck. And they've been translated into roughly 22 different languages. Um, if I kept reading probably his bio, we'd probably be here for a little bit longer. So I'm going to move on from there. Uh, the way it's going to work as far as the structure, uh, each particular speaker will get 15 minutes uh, to give a sort of initial presentation. Uh, after each have given their 15 minute presentation, uh, we will then move on to just a sort of discussion amongst the panelists. Uh, that will take place for about a half hour to 45 minutes. After that, we will move to audience Q&A. You'll notice there are two microphones. Uh, what I'd like to have you do is to line up behind the microphones when you get to the Q&A period, uh, and then you can address your questions to our panelists. Uh, so, without further ado, the order is going to be first, Professor Frank, then, Professor Wenzel, then Professor Price, then Professor Horowitz. So without further ado, uh, please give a hand for Professor Frank. Thanks very much, Shane. Yeah, I uh, think about forums like this where you have different points of view represented. I think the tendency is for people often to talk past one another, and that's really especially been a problem in the inequality arena. I think our tendency has been to argue about the, the concepts in terms of things like fairness and justice. Those are very difficult concepts to agree on what they mean. Uh, different, different people come at them from different angles. And, and so the debates really yielded a precious little progress over the last 10 or 12 years since it's really heated up. What I'm going to try to do is to take a completely different tack. Uh, I'm going to uh, view inequality from the perspective of trying to assess what are the practical consequences of it. Does it have any benefits? Are there any costs which, which are likely to loom larger? 
and and my overall uh, strategy is to try to defend uh, a, a claim that will strike many people as unreasonable. I'm going to try to defend the claim that inequality causes problems not just for low and middle income families. I think that's the, the conventional view, but it's also made life less worth living for people at the top of the income ladder who are the ostensible beneficiaries of inequality. And uh, the, the argument I'll offer in favor of that claim is very simple and very few moving parts. Uh, not one of them is controversial, uh, in my opinion, but if anyone disagrees, I'm all ears. So the, the basic facts of the matter we used to argue about, but, but not so much anymore, it's that most of the income gains have gone uh, during the last four decades to people at the top of the income level. Incomes elsewhere in the distribution have been largely static. Uh, it's not just that people in the top fifth are getting all the gains, uh, the, the real gains are there, but if you look at the top fifth, it's the same pattern as for the population as a whole. It's the top 5% are getting most of the gains within the top fifth, then within that group it's the top 1% and so on, all the way up to the top one-tenth or one one-hundredth of a percent. The gains get bigger and bigger the higher up you go. And so, really, it's, it's kind of a fractal phenomenon. And the question is, uh, is this a problem? And if so, is there anything we can or should try to do about it? And the, the linchpin of the argument I'm going to offer uh, is very simple. It's that all human evaluation depends to one extent or another on a relevant frame of reference. It's the, every judgment we make is context dependent. So I hope you can see on the screen uh, this simple drawing, which of the two vertical lines is longer is the question I pose to you. Uh, since you're on a university campus, you're all smart, uh, you're suspecting a trick, and so many of you will have the impulse to say perhaps that they're the same length. Uh, if you have that impulse, well, you're right. But the question really uh, I should pose is, which line looks longer? If you think they look the same, then you really should schedule a neurological checkup. If you have a normal human brain, the line on the right ought to look longer to you just because of the difference in context where it sits. Context matters when we evaluate distance. If there's three miles left on a 300-mile journey, are we almost there? Of course, if there's three miles left on a four-mile journey, are we almost there yet? No, of course not. Uh, and so it's not controversial to, to say that temperature is context dependent, length, uh, weight, all things of that sort are. And in the same vein, judgments about consumption goods are context dependent. Uh, the house I hope you're seeing on your screen is like the one I lived in Nepal when I was a Peace Corps volunteer there years ago. It had two rooms. Uh, it had no electricity, no running water. Uh, never for a moment did that house seem uh, in any way less than satisfactory during the two years I lived in it. I was proud to have colleagues over. Uh, it was a totally adequate house in that environment. It was indeed uh, considered quite a nice house in that local environment. If I lived in that house in Ithaca, New York, it would not be considered an adequate house. My kids wouldn't want their friends to know where we live. They would be ashamed. Uh, I would be ashamed for people to see where we live. Here, in fact, is the house where I do live in Ithaca, New York. If my friends in Nepal would see this house, they would think I'd taken complete leave of my senses. What would anyone need such a grand house for? They would wonder. Why so many bathrooms? Is there a problem? Uh, the, the house in Ithaca doesn't strike people as uh, being over the top in, in, in any sense of the term. It's just a normal middle income professor's house in, in our context. That's the way the world is. I don't think that's a controversial statement. Uh, I don't think it would make any sense to exhort people not to have context shape their evaluations. This is just a given in, in human evaluation. Here's where inequality enters the picture. What are people at the top doing with all the extra money? Uh, they're, they're buying more of all the things people at every level of income buy when they have more money. In particular, one thing they're doing is building bigger houses. Uh, the, the 
middle class, doesn't seem angered by that. It doesn't seem like a moral failure, really, on the part of the rich to spend on bigger houses. Many people wag their fingers at them and say they shouldn't spend so lavishly, but really there are different standards for every group. And a house like this doesn't seem over the top if you travel in a certain circle. The middle class wants to see pictures of these houses. They're not made unhappy by them. There was a group just below the top, though. They travel in the same social circles as the people in the top. They attend the same weddings. Maybe it's now the custom to have your daughter's wedding reception at home rather than in a hotel or country club. The group just below the top needs to build bigger to accommodate that custom. Then there's a group just below them that they have now the need to be able to host dinner parties for 24, not 18. They build bigger. And that cascades all the way down the income ladder. There's no other way to explain why the median new house in the United States is now 50% bigger than its counterpart from 1980. The median income earner doesn't have more income than before. Why does the median income earner spend more on housing than the median earner did in 1980? It's because others like him are spending more. But why are they spending more? It's because people just above them are spending more. And the ultimate answer to all those why questions is the people at the top are spending more. And they're spending more just because they have more money. So, so far, no more violations. Everybody's acting in a perfectly normal way. People in the middle are experiencing some stress, however, because since they don't have more money than before, and they're spending a lot more on housing than before, it's harder for them to make ends meet. And you might say, well, if you can't afford the house that you're living in, buy a smaller one, buy a less expensive one. And that would be one thing if the only consequence would be that you would feel like, well, I won't have vaulted ceilings, won't that be a hardship? Get used to it would be the right response to that concern. There's another cost, though, and that is that in virtually every jurisdiction, the good schools are located in more expensive neighborhoods. A good school is also a context-dependent phenomenon. Every parent wants to send its children to a good school. And what that means, if you're the median earner, is if you want to send your kid to a school of just average quality, you've got to match the average level of expenditure for housing in your area, or else it's your kids who will go to the schools that have metal detectors out front and low scores in reading and math. And so people do everything they can to keep up. My colleagues and I have examined census data. In the 100 largest counties, inequality went up in the most recent census periods in each and every one of them, but it went up by different amounts across those counties. In the counties where inequality grew the most, we saw the biggest increases in direct or indirect symptoms of financial distress, which is exactly the prediction of the expenditure cascade hypothesis. We saw the biggest increase in bankruptcy filings in the counties where inequality grew the most. Marriage counselors say the couples who come to see them are almost invariably reporting financial difficulties, among whatever other problems that bring them to the table. The divorce rates increased more rapidly in the counties where inequality grew the most. Another margin that families work when they can't make ends meet is to move farther from the center. And sure enough, in the counties where inequality grew the most, the commutes longer than one hour each way grew by the largest amount between census periods. There are OECD country data that show when inequality is high over the business cycle, people work longer hours. In countries where it's higher than in others, people there work longer hours. These are all consistent with the claim that what you feel you need depends on what others around you have. That's not a human failing. That's just part of what it means to be a human being. Here's an index I constructed very quickly from available data. I call it the toil index. How many hours per month does the median earner need to work to earn enough to pay the rent on the median price house in the area? From 1950 to 1970, that was a roughly constant number. A little bit more than 40 hours each month would earn you enough to pay the rent on the median price house. As inequality began rising and median incomes began to grow more slowly, we saw those twin forces interact 
to push up the Toro Index. It peaked at over 100 hours per month just before the bursting of the housing bubble, and it's almost that high again. We see expenditure cascades in a whole variety of areas. In 1980, the average American wedding adjusted for inflation was $11,000. By 2010, it had grown to $27,000. In 2014, it was $31,000. In Manhattan, it was $76,000 last year. Nobody believes that the people who are getting married today are happier because they're spending three times as much as they did in 1980. Weddings have gotten more expensive because of an expenditure cascade launched by higher spending at the top. Pure and simple. There's no other parsimonious way to explain that change. There's a very simple fix for that that I think liberals and conservatives could agree on. It's to scrap the income tax in favor of a much more steeply progressive tax on total consumption expenditure. Here's the Jones family. Their income is $50,000. Their annual savings is $5,000. We have a big standard deduction under this proposal. Their taxable consumption for the year would be measured as their income, the $50,000, minus the standard deduction, minus their savings. Since you can only either spend or save your income, your income minus your savings is the amount you actually spent during the year. So that gives us taxable consumption. Tax rate starts out low, low tax bill for people in the lower reaches of this distribution. But once consumption rises beyond a certain point, the tax rate can rise much, much higher than under the current income tax and in a way that will cause harm to no family. Here's the thought experiment that illustrates the basic magic implicit in the progressive consumption tax. Imagine a world like ours where we have an income tax. The wealthiest drivers buy the Ferrari F12 Berlinetta, $333,000. If we had a progressive consumption tax, they would scale back. That car would be twice as expensive for the high rollers under a progressive consumption tax. They could instead buy a Porsche 911 Turbo for $150,000, whose after-tax price would come in about where the Ferrari is now. And they would still be driving the best car among high rollers in that society. And so that car would serve just about equally well as the Ferrari does in the current society. Car buffs will quibble. Some will even say that the Porsche was a better car than the Berlinetta. But let's grant the assumption that the Berlinetta is better. If it's better, it's not much better. That's the law of diminishing returns. By the time you're up to $150,000, that car has got all the meaningful performance features a car could expect to have. That's not the end of the story, though. The progressive consumption tax raises a lot of revenue from the buyer of the Porsche 911 Turbo. And the overall package you would get under that tax would be much, much better for the wealthy than the package they have now. Here's the thought experiment that I think clinches that claim for me. Who's happier? Somebody who drives the Ferrari, the $300,000 Ferrari, in today's society with roads riddled with foot-deep potholes, or somebody in the progressive consumption tax environment driving a Porsche 911 Turbo on well-maintained roads? To me, that's an easy call. I would think it would be a very daunting task to try to defend the claim that the Ferrari driver on pothole-ridden roads would be happier. So that's the basic argument. As I said, a few moving parts. Context matters. Context will matter no matter what we do. But we can slow the race to outdo one another just by changing the terms of trade using the tax system. It's a tax proposal that conservatives have favored. There's an AEI book out two years ago advocating precisely this tax. Milton Friedman once advocated it in the New York article published in 1943. We could do this. And if we did do that, there would be much, much less inequality of consumption, much, much less stress on people in the middle. The wealthy would live in smaller mansions, but there's no indication that that would make them any less happy. Beyond a certain point, going from 50,000 square foot mansions to 75,000 square foot mansions across the board probably makes rich people less happy than before. It's a bigger nuisance to care for the bigger property, more staff to supervise, and so on. So that's it. That's my opening statement. Thank you. 
for your kind attention. I hope the technology worked and that you heard some of that. So how does, okay, great. I'm adjust the microphone a little bit. Of course, the first thing I tell my students when uh, they're making presentations is that they should uh, come out from behind the lectern so I'm gonna stand behind the lectern. Uh, this has been a weird road. About three years ago, I was asked by a Unitarian church to give a talk on income inequality, and I had about three weeks to prepare it, so I said, sure, I'll do that, and I went home that night thinking, I have absolutely nothing to say. And over the next three weeks, I was able to find something to say, and the only odd part about it was that they had me speak at the pulpit, which is not a place I'm generally comfortable being because I'm more used to being an academic than a preacher. Um, the second odd thing I suppose about this is I'm really grateful for this invitation. I'm happy to be here. This is wonderful and I thank you. And, and to thank you for that invitation, I'm basically going to say, really interesting question you asked, but it's the wrong question, I'm sorry. So I'm going to discuss something else entirely. <laughs> so, um, let's see. If the, is, that on? is there an on for this? Yeah. I'm technologically challenged, so this will take a second. Oh, there we go. So my, mo my motivation basically is everybody talks about income inequality, but I'm not convinced that we're asking the right questions. And I'm not convinced that a focus on income inequality is actually helpful for the least fortunate elements of society. What are my priors? They're up there. I'm an economist, so um, I thought we'd get, I'd point out simply, people matter, individuals matter, dignity matters, and poverty and injustice are bad. That's where I'm starting. So as an overview of my talk, I'm going to spend about five minutes talking about the actual figures on income disparity in the U.S., and there is rising income inequality in the U.S., but then I'm going to spend most of my time asking whether it's the right question and what the cost of worrying about inequality is as opposed to the cost of worrying about other things, perhaps, like absolute levels of poverty. And then I'm going to make the claim that we're currently fighting poverty the wrong way and that the focus on inequality is actually detrimental and propose um, a solution in the end. So... In terms of income inequality in the U.S., there's absolutely no doubt from 1970 to 2007 that there was a drop in the income received by the bottom fifth of households in the U.S., not quite 1%, and a rise in the income received uh, by the top households by about 6.5%. I stop at 2007 because the Great Recession uh, skews the figures. Ultimately, if we go back to the figures of the recession and recovery, I think it actually bolsters my case. But I've stopped at 2007 intentionally because such an economic shock as we saw in 2007 makes for messy data. But then you've got to ask some questions. Okay, so who are these rich people that we're talking about? Well, 56% of Americans are in the top decile, the top 10% of income earners at some point, And the top 1% is actually the top 12%, but there's a lot of churn and shift. So we need to be careful about what we're talking about. Amongst the top 400 tax returns, 73% of them appear only once from in the span of 15 years from 1992 to 2007. 27% appear more than once, 15% appear more than twice, and only seven of those appear in all 16 years. So even though we're looking at households, there's movement within those in terms of who belongs to those households. Same thing with the poor. We have to think these are actual real people not just lumps of people who are permanently in a quintile and that's that, they're in the bottom 20% or the medium 20 no, people are moving in and out of these um, quintiles. A majority of the people in the bottom 20% of earners in the US have also been in the top 20% at some point in the past 30 years. Less than 1% of the American population remains permanently in the bottom 20%. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't return there at some point, but they're not permanently in that 20%, so we need to be careful about statistics and data. Between 96 and 2005, of those who were in the middle quintile, 42% went up, 25% went down, and 33% remained in the middle quintile. So we've got some movement as we go along. We've also got to ask ourselves, who are households? We need to be careful. Statistics, I'm using the Census Bureau data, measure households rather than individuals. And as you can see from the screen, 39 million people are in the bottom 20%. But 64 million people are in the top 20%. I think Steve uh, Horwitz is going to address some of those figures in terms of um, why that may be. And of course, we have to remember that by definition, 50% of Americans will live below the median income, regardless of whether we're all millionaires or poor. That's the very definition of the median. You look at the median, half the observations are above, and half the observations are below. 
So with that, I have to ask the question, are we asking the right question? So let's look at what happened over the span 1970 to 2007. Yes, there is no doubt the share of income earned by the bottom 20% went down, and the share of income earned by the top 20% went up. But we also need to look at the fact that real GDP, that is national production, national wealth, adjusted for inflation, increased by a factor of three over that period. So the poorest 20% of the population are earning a slightly, large, slightly smaller piece, 1%, of an economic pie that is three times bigger. There is an element of good news. Likewise, if we look at the lower shares but the absolute increases over that same period of time, yes, the top 20% um, of earners have increased their income, their production by 63%, but the bottom quintile has increased its income by 22%. Not enough, but still an element of good news as I make the case here that we should be focusing on something other than income inequality. Likewise, if we look at US median income growth, that is half of earners above and half of earners below, we have seen a 20% increase over those past 35 years. So there's not all bad news. There's plenty of bad news, and I'm gonna to turn to that in a moment, but it's not all bad news. So I wanna continue here with a thought exercise. If we wanna fight inequality, there's something that we're gonna to have to do about it, and there will be a cost to that. If you've ever taken an economics class, you've heard the statement probably, there is no such thing as a free lunch. So if you wanna fight inequality, you're gonna to have to change the institutions, you're gonna to have to redistribute wealth in order to figure out how to fight that inequality. And so I've got here a thought exercise for you of a society that is focused on growth and ignores inequality, and another society that focuses on inequality and trying to diminish it at the cost of growth. So if we look at the year fictitiously 1910, growth society starts out with the richest third of the population earning four times more than the poorest third, and the fairness society redistributes some wealth such that there's not quite that disparity, and you can see up there, the poorest in this case are earning 1,500 versus 3,500 for the rich. The cost of that, of course, of redistribution is going to be that growth society is going to grow faster than fairness society, because there's going to be a cost to fighting inequality, and I'll get to that in a moment. At the end of one century, growth society has become even more unequal than fairness society has. So if you look at the end of the century, the rich in fair society are making two and a half times more versus four times more in growth society. But ask yourself, what about the lot of the poor? Over the span of a century, we've had very insignificant economic growth. The poorest elements of society are making only $10,000 per year in fairness society, whereas the hypothetical growth society, they're making $50,000 a year because they've been able to take part and benefit from the overall growth. Some people might object that there may be higher prices in growth society because more people are buying things, higher demand means higher prices, but we can also anticipate that with greater wealth comes greater investment, comes cheaper production. Think about the price of your computer today versus the first computers that were out 30 years ago when you were paying the equivalent of four, five, six thousand dollars for a computer with 128K of memory. Now, that probably doesn't even compute with most of you in this room because you're already used to thinking about megs and gigs. 128K for about $5,000 seems ridiculous. Prices have actually gone down because of the investments that have gone into technology. So, with that, the more controversial part that we have here, there's often going to be a trade-off and efforts to reduce inequality are actually going to hurt the poorest elements in society. So with that, I'm going to give you a brief primer on public choice theory. Public choice theory is simply economic analysis of government. So, I like to call this politics without romance. Instead of assuming that the government is out to help people and is acting in the public interest, we look instead and say, people are people. Whether they're acting in the private sector or the government, what kinds of incentives are they facing? Bureaucrats can do very good things and very bad things. People in the private sector, bankers or industrialists, can do very good things or very bad things. What incentives do they face? Well, the first problem that we have, of course, is regulatory capture. When we look at the idea that regulators, who is in the best position to understand how the banking sector works? The bankers themselves. Who is in the best position to understand, if you look at, you probably all heard of Monsanto at some point, 
one of the top executives at Monsanto, who's now a vice president, has gone in and out of positions as, as uh, top administrator of the Food and Drug Administration, back into Monsanto, back into the Food and Drug Administration with a promotion each time. Now, you may be for or against genetically modified organisms, but there seems something fishy about the head of Monsanto being the head regulator of food and drug or, um, in the United States. Likewise, we talk about the special interest effect, which talks about the fact that policies may persist even if they're bad, if they have concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. All of you in this room are paying an average of $17 a year to support an inefficient American sugar industry. Most of you probably didn't know that. Prices are higher on sugar because the American sugar industry has captured the political process. I will venture a bet that none of you is going to go out tomorrow to call your state senator or your US senator to fight to save $17. But if you multiply 17 by 300 million, which is beyond my brain capacity at this point in the day, you're gonna get a really big number and the sugar industry has an incentive to maintain that because there is a concentrated benefit and a diffuse cost. So if we look at some of the examples, Obamacare and George W. Bush, both of them, this is not a Democrat or Republican problem, both of them were working closely with the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance industry to get laws passed, and it makes perfect sense. If you're an insurer, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could have a law that forces every American to buy your product? Um, marijuana legalization. Failed in California a few years ago, mostly on opposition from alcohol, because we all know that alcohol is good for you and marijuana is bad for you, and on opposition from law enforcement, because people get really violent when they smoke marijuana, if you're a bag of Doritos. And the examples go on and on, and I'm going to skip through here, and I'm going to come back to Walmart in a second, and my worry in all of this is crony capitalism. So if we look at the increases in the government spending over the past century or so, it's not just a question of absolute expenditure, it's what is that government spending doing? And who is controlling the government spending and to whose benefit? It is estimated that the average co the, uh, cost per year for Americans of complying with regulations is almost $2 trillion. Who's gonna be in a better position to comply with regulations? People at the higher end of the spectrum or people at the lower end of the spectrum? So even if they're well-meaning, we need to be careful about regulations that may allegedly be out to help poor people, but may actually end up hurting them. Today, 30% of Americans require an occupational license, up from 5% in the 50s. I can see an occupational license for lawyers and doctors and accountants. Hairdressers, florists, not so much. The average time to become an EMT in the US is about 300 hours of training. The average time to become a hairdresser is 2,000 hours of training. So all these occupational licenses are hurting the poorest people in society most. Five-sixths of wealth transfers in the US, so about 85% of wealth transfers are not means tested. That means that they're not going from richer people to poorer people, but from less visible and less organized to more visible and more organized people. It's impossible to have redistribution of wealth without disrupting the production process. Minimum wage laws which sound like a great idea on paper, are especially going to hurt the poorest elements of society who do not have the skill set required to earn enough to be able to make a job with a minimum wage. And we see this especially amongst teenagers who have a hard time getting their very first job. And finally, most households in the bottom quintile have nobody working. The problem we have with the war on poverty today is that it looks at alleviation at the, in the short term of poverty rather than creating opportunities for the poorest elements of society to have more opportunities to gain and more opportunities to earn. So if we look at the number of people in poverty in the United States, it actually was going down before the war on poverty started in 1964 and has gone up since. We currently have about 46 million people living in poverty in the US in spite of $700 billion per year in expenditure on the war on poverty. More poverty, more expenditure. More poverty, more expenditure. There's a problem here. It's not working. So what do we do? So I'm going to zip forward because I've only got about a minute left. But I'm going to ask you about a thought exercise. Would you rather live in a world where the poorest people starve and the richest people are barely subsisting? That's a fairly equal world. Or would you rather live in a world where the poorest people have basics, the things that we consider essential to being a participant in society like education, like food, like housing, and then the rich are super rich. I would like to propose the claim that instead of worrying about income inequality, we should look at how the poorest people in society are doing and focus on making their lot in life better. 
You can think again of your scenario in life. Would you be happier making a fraction of what your boss is making, even if you're making more, or would you rather live in a world of equality? So I'm gonna close in the next 30 seconds or so, because I could speak on this for hours and hours. John Rawls, a philosopher who is very concerned with income inequality, talks about the importance of basic rights and inequalities being acceptable only if they work to the advantage of all. So I'm gonna make this claim finally that crony capitalism is not going to advance that because it's not gonna maximize rights. Redistribution is also gonna be a problem. So what we need to do is focus on economic liberties, which is ultimately just a technical term for the right to earn a living. So we have to have liberty and unfettered markets and the most opportunity possible for the poorest people to thrive and participate in society. I'm gonna close very quickly with two graphs. If we look at economic freedom and income, there's basically no difference across the world in the distribution of income to the bottom 10% of society in the freest countries in the world versus the least free countries in the world. So distribution itself, it's not an impact. However, if you look at income in freer societies versus unfree societies, the bottom 10% are making significantly more than people in the lowest quartile of income and of, of economic freedom. So in closing, I'm simply going to say, we can't deny that income inequality exists. But I would like to propose to you tonight that income inequality is not the thing that we should be looking at. We should be looking instead at the lot of the poorest in society and what we can do to make them better off in absolute terms rather than, re um, rather than the relative terms of how they're doing compared to the wealthiest elements of society. Thank you. All right. I'm very much used to walking around, very uncomfortable standing still, but I'll do, actually, I can probably just take this off, right? It's not gonna get any feedback or anything. Huh? Wired. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can't move it. All right. It's also uh, disrespectful of my height. I don't know if we know this. I have a smaller stool. Than I think this is a, a really poor version of leveling down. Yes, actually, it's, it's a really quality on. metaphor. Um, they're really inefficient because people don't see how tall I am, if nothing else. Oh wait, it doesn't feel good for me. I guess that's what counts. All right, well very quickly, uh, I wanna thank uh, the Institute for Humane Studies for uh, funding this panel and the Center for uh, Ethics and Public Policy, and I wanna thank Shane for putting this panel together. Um, I'm sure many of you are here be precisely because you know Professor Cortland. Um, I don't know if your assessment of Duluth area democracy or democratic health is that it's really flourishing or that it's on life support, but however well it's doing, it's doing what as well as it is in large part because of this person and his efforts and the efforts of the center. So he's a constant, he should be a constant sort of source of pride to the university and to the community. So thank you so much for um, inviting us all here. Um, let me start with uh, a succinct uh, description of, uh, let's see, that should be, okay. <clears throat> So I don't want anyone to leave here without knowing what I think about these things, because I'm not going to say a lot in this 15 minutes about what I think, but, so, but rather try to give us some normative tools, some lenses. I'm the only philosopher uh, on this group. Everyone else is an economist. I like reading economics. I like mixing it up with data, and I'm, I'm definitely going to be doing that. I can tell already um, when we get to discussion. But instead, I'm going to talk a bit about um, some, some moral frameworks, some normative frameworks we could use to say, to try and answer the question, is inequality, growing inequality, a problem or not? And I want everyone to know what I think. What I think is that it is. I think it's unjust. I think it undermines democracy, the present state of affairs. And I think it threatens the liberty of many Americans on a number of different senses of liberty. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a bit about these different conceptions. Uh, again, I'm, my goal here is to provide us something of a shared vocabulary to have this discussion, right? Some background with which we just don't say, well, that's fair, that's unfair, or complain, or this, uh, can you believe this house he has, or whatever. Um, okay, so let's look at theories of justice. Uh, within, within work on academic work on theories of justice, a common distinction is made and I'm craning my neck here, hopefully you're not, but a common distinction is made between what are called relational theories of justice, uh, and this would include John Rawls, Elizabeth Anderson, Nancy Fraser, and countless other examples, versus what might be called responsibility-centered theories of justice. And the basic distinction uh, here is this. For relational theories of justice, 
uh, a society is unjust insofar as people cannot relate to each other as, as Rawls would put it, free and equal, and what it means for Rawls to relate to each other as free and equal is to have inequalities follow certain sorts of criteria. Um, Liz Anderson talks about democratic equality. Nancy Frazier argues uh, that justice is what it would mean to participate as a peer in civil society. Uh, what it would mean to be unjust according to these standards then would be something like this uh, feudal life that I've uh, tried to put here in my picture, which is that there is a clear established hierarchy between different citizens. Um, for the responsibility-centered folks, um, the question is not so much uh, whether you can relate to each other as equals, but rather fundamentally whether or not inequalities reflect your responsible choices. You might think of this as broadly, very broadly speaking, an equal opportunity conception of justice. So inequalities are just on this conception insofar as they're the product of responsible choices, right? So if this, if you will, if the cards are stacked against you uh, and it's very difficult to move up, people's, if people's well-being tends to reflect all sorts of factors that are not something that they are responsible for, that would be an injustice. Uh, that would be this remarkably unlevel playing field um, that I've put up there. No one's laughing. I think it's a funny picture. <laughs> um, uh, whereas if inequalities did not reflect these sorts of responsible choices, um, if they did, then, you know, whether the, the picture on the left would be perfectly fine if everybody started with a level playing field. Okay. Now, I want to very briefly, and this should just work with an arrow instead of this, but this one. This is, uh, and I'm not looking for a plug for Mac. I'm a Mac guy, and this is a PC, so I, I'm working on it. I want to, uh, just in case no one says, you know, what about historical entitlement theories of justice? So historical entitlement theories of justice look like this. And I'm just going to talk about very briefly, and I'm going to move past it. Um, historical entitlement theories of justice basically say that uh, the current distribution of wealth doesn't matter who has how much, provided that the history of acquisition is just. Whether the people who, whether you received it as the product of, as that person up above is, uh, mixing their labor with the earth, or freely exchanging or passing it on to their kids, uh, provided that that's what history looks like, as opposed to a history of factor of expropriation, and so on and so forth, then it doesn't matter how much inequality according to this theory, provided uh, what's called the Lockean proviso, which means provided that there is, is much and is good left, meaning uh, we have no reason to complain about uh, someone expropriating the land for their benefit if I can just go over to the next field and plow it. If I can't do that, if the only way I can make a living is by someone telling me that they will pay me to do something, that's a very different situation. And finally, the principle of rectification. So insofar as history doesn't reflect this just history of acquisition, say if not only does it not reflect free exchange, but it reflects a history of where, say, people were property, didn't have equal rights and liberties. Or alternatively, I could just as easily put a picture of indigenous population up here. Uh, or if whole, if the, pro the root of property um, is, is rooted in expropriation, something which from this particular sort of self-ownership libertarian position uh, would be clearly unjust, then we need to rectify. We need to make it so that it looks as close as we can to the principle of justice. Otherwise, this theory, as Robert Nozick says, just simply doesn't apply in the status quo. We can basically ignore it until we do these principle of rectification. Now, I'm not a self-ownership libertarian, but I wanted to make sure that that was out there so that no one said, well, you ignored Nozick, and he's super important, and he is. Um, okay. Now, let's return to this picture on the left. Okay. So, these, so, again, we have this, this kind of debate. Now, the, now one of the, is society just according to these standards? Now, one of the problems, and one thing that I've written about extensively, is this idea that we don't often, uh, I'm not going to blame these people, that social scientists, policy studies, the U.S. Census Bureau, whatever, the, the, where we get our data, don't often give the data that we actually need in order to assess equal opportunity or relational egalitarianism, or, for that matter, um, um, libertarian self-ownership thesis like Locke, uh, his, uh, excuse me, like uh, Nozick history of acquisition. But from the data we have, I think we have substantial reason to believe that both a growing number of American citizens are unable to relate to each other as peers, are clearly dominated. There's a clear hierarchy within society, something that the people on the left would find unjust, and something that the people on the right would also find unjust because, and again, social mobility is the data we tend to have. That's not the same as a normative conception of equal opportunity. But given the data we have, there seems to be a tremendous link between inequality and a variety of other factors and social mobility. 
right? So given the best data we have, and the, the map on the left here is a huge data set, Raj Chetty, uh, Manual Size, and others have recently put together on social mobility in the United States. Um, and the red, the red areas have really shitty mobility, uh, excuse me, uh, no one was offended. And uh, the blue areas tend to do well. There's all sorts of problems. There's all sorts of things that I would do to interpret this data, but since I don't have time, all I want to say is that there seems to be a real strong tie between inequality, economic segregation, educational quality and availability, poverty, and social mobility, right? And what these things point to, sometimes called the so-called Great Gatsby Curve, is that, is that societies that have these characteristics tend to have comparatively poor social mobility. What this means is that it might be the case that the, the debate in many ways between the relational egalitarians and the responsibility centered egalitarians is somewhat academic, right? I mean, we, we philosophers are disagreeable sorts. We tend to disagree with each other a lot and we tend to emphasize our disagreements rather than our agreements. But what this reality points to is that there might be a substantial practical overlap between what seem to be diametrically opposed theories of justice. And if that overlap exists, that's really powerful. Because then what we're saying is we have the three main theories of justice we're talking about. According to all of them, society, American society, and our trends towards greater inequality are probably the problem. So uh, you don't have to, I don't have to convince you of one theory is my essential claim. I can convince you by any of the theories that we have a problem with. Democracy. Let's look at democracy, okay? Within, the, within debates about democracy, is it valuable, is it not valuable, and then is it valuable, if it is, how? Well, one way of saying it's valuable is to say that it's intrinsically valuable. What this means is that it's valuable because it's the only, this is, you know, again, this is a huge body of literature that I'm giving a very quick summary of. And I, I will have citations for these things. If you want to ask me for citations, I'll give them to you. But very basic idea here is that uh, citizens in a free society, a free and equal society, ought to, are going to inevitably disagree about the rules that govern their collective life. Right? So some argue that given this disagreement, given our diversity, given our different interests, and so on and so forth, democracy is the only legitimate procedure to resolve these disputes. Right? And, it's, and we can't say, well, just leave it up to the market, because the disputes include how should we structure the market. Right? It's not like the market is like a neutral way to go. So there's this, there's this a debate about how we structure the market and how these disputes are. Right? How do you resolve it? Some say, well, Given this diversity, everyone ought to have an equal say. And that laws are only legitimate. That is, they only justifiably claim authority over us, or just, you know, they only respect us insofar as they're existing. Others claim that democracy is valuable, but instrumentally is a tool. Democracy is valuable precisely because uh, democracy um, uh, gets better results than every other way. I mean, I think one thing that all the panelists here are going to agree to is that, broadly speaking, market societies have worked better than every other form of society. And I think what we'd also all agree on is that, broadly speaking, democratic societies have worked better than all other forms of society. And I think our, our disagreements are going to be, how should we structure markets? How do we structure democratic institutions? Right? But some argue that it's, it's, it's democratic societies are important because they're epistemologically superior, unlike a totalitarian regime where you have a small cadre of people who <coughs> decide everything. Presumably, a healthy democracy, anyway, is one where lots of different perspectives, lots of different groups um, are heard. Um, and, uh, and that they, they help check concentrations of power. This is something that's argued from across the ideological spectrum. Um, and they also are effective insofar as they protect the interests of poor. So Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen famously argues that healthy dem or democracies with a free press don't experience famines. Uh, I don't like to think of democracy as a yes or no in the way that that phraseology, I say, I say democracy is probably more better or worse is a better way of thinking about it. But one thing we can definitely say is that healthy democracies do a better job at protecting the interests of the poor than unhealthy democracies. Okay, so do we have a democracy issue? Inequality, economic inequality is in and of itself not a problem. It's only a problem insofar as the economic sphere infects the political or democratic sphere. <laughs> right? So whether or not economic inequality is a problem for democracy is fundamentally a question of, does that translate into political inequality? And I think we have a huge collection of data right now that says that that's exactly what's happening. Um, you know, uh, the, 
I'm so uh, thrilled to be on the uh, panel with uh, Robert Frank. Uh, he wrote a book on Winner Take All Society. He's one of the co-authors. Uh, Hacker and Pearson have this book, Winner Take All Politics, highly recommended. Uh, Unequal Democracy by Bartles, also heck, highly recommended. Many argue that functionally, the, on many issues that govern how we live together, including how we structure our markets, that the opinions of the 50% poorest of the population are functionally irrelevant from a democratic perspective. Now, I'm not going to convince you of that, Dan. But if, if that analysis is true, and the amount of money, particularly post-Citizen United, but not just post-Citizen United ruling, if that situation is true, if you think that people are lobbying the government for no reason, you might say they're spending money, but it doesn't matter, democracy is perfectly healthy. But if you think it's not, right? if you think that they're spending the money for some reason, and that this money buys influence, then this is a huge problem. right? Economic inequality leads to, as that center cartoon, somebody having lots more savings. Right. Now, if this analysis is correct, this idea that economic inequality in the United States is translating into uh, political inequality and democratic inequality, then it's a problem for all conceptions of why democracy is right. It's a problem for those who think it's intrinsically valuable. It's, it's, it's nothing short of a crisis of democracy or legitimacy. Right. But for those who think that it's a valuable as an instrument, it's also a problem. Again, like the justice issue, the democracy, the democracy tool, we can disagree quite a lot. Philosophers do all the time. We disagree, again, we disagree with each other. We tend to emphasize these different disagreements. But the fact of the matter is, you know, and I don't think philosophy should try and pretend to be a normal science or something like that, but the nature of philosophy is such that there might be the case that inequality is a problem according to all of these theories. Because if this person on the back has a lot more say than her, and if her voice is functionally irrelevant, that harms the epistemological effect. Right, because lots of people are being hurt. You don't get that benefit. It also inhibits the ability of democratic institutions to protect the interests of the poor. So, if the views and the interests of the poor are functionally irrelevant, they can be functionally ignored. And for this reason, it's not surprising that societies with great inequalities of income and wealth are also societies that have higher poverty rates than their peers. You can ignore the poor if they have no say. And this is really important. And what we need to recognize is that even if we believe that our fundamental concern shouldn't be equality, but poverty, not we shouldn't be fundamentally concerned with how well off we are relative to each other. I think Frank has lots of really important things to say about that. But how well off the poor are, then it still matters. If economic inequality translates into political inequality, right? then it threatens the very institutions that might protect the poor and those in poverty. That is, if great <coughs> economic inequalities translate into democratic inequalities, they threaten instruments and institutions that enable people to have enough. Right? They threaten what Sen calls protective securities, social welfare measures, other things that prevent people from falling below a certain threshold. But they also make markets function worse. Right? They enable crony capitalism. As I argue in a recent paper on Milton Friedman, even if our ideal is a society of comparatively little government influence in the economic sphere, and where democratic powers are significantly limited by Friedman wants an economic bill of rights, um, even, in the, even if we agree with Friedman about what the ideal is, democratic inequalities in the status quo are still a major problem that cannot be ignored. Neither can inequalities in wealth and income that, given our institutions, translate into democratic inequality. Now, of course, for those of us who are more concerned with equality and democracy than Friedman might actually be, um, it's even a worse problem. Right? But even if all we're concerned about is poverty, if we recognize this link between democratic health and poverty, and we recognize the fact that people who aren't heard can be legislated against, then inequality, if it translates into democratic inequality, becomes a major problem. And finally, very, 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 very briefly, because I look and I see that Shane has a stopwatch and I hadn't realized that. Um, and now that I'm egregiously free riding on you for a minute and a half. Um, it, also, it also inhibits uh, freedom as well. On a variety of different conceptions, I would love to talk more about this, but I'm going to focus on two, and I'm going to do it in 30 seconds, which means that it'll be a complete blur and you won't have any idea. But you can look at those books. Uh, do those. So uh, capability freedom, right? Inequality can undermine capability freedom. Another way of putting this is that 
GDP per capita is very different than freedom per capita if we understand freedom in a capability sense because freedom, because freedom in a capability sense depends upon distribution. It depends upon distribution in terms of political control over one's life, in terms of material control over one's life, these are two central capabilities. Um, and bodily integrity, citizens, equally wealthy states with high amounts of inequalities tend to have high amounts of violent crime. And just health and life in jeopardy. High poverty states also have low mobility, but they also tend to have less freedom just to live a good life. And finally, Republican freedom. Inequality can translate very strict, strongly into domination, to some citizens having a, a higher <coughs> role over another. And for a Republican, this is not a Republican in a way that translates really at all at this point, maybe a little bit McCain, into the contemporary Republican Party. <coughs> Historically, people like Thomas Jefferson and so on, they thought freedom was, you think of freedom as being not dominated by your fellow citizens. Unequal society, you're dominated. Now there's ways to ameliorate that domination uh, without equality, like basic income that's unconditional or workplace democracy, and those are alternatives for the Republican. But in, I, I, my argument is that in the institutional status quo, our inequality also undermines the freedom of many American citizens. Thank you. great to have this diversity of voices, as you said, and for us to have an opportunity to exchange ideas with each other and, and with you guys as well. And thank you all for coming out and spending your Thursday evening with us. Um, I want to talk about inequality, but I also want to talk about a particular kind of inequality tonight, and that's consumption inequality. We've been talking a lot about income and wealth, and in, certainly in Bob Frank's opening remarks, he talked about consumption issues. And I want to sort of follow up on that and also follow up on a couple of things that Nikolai talked about in his talk. And, and look at this question of consumption inequality. What I want to argue is that we're living in a time of declining consumption inequality. And I want to put forth the more, perhaps, uh, radical argument that that declining consumption inequality might be, to some degree anyway, a function of existing income and wealth inequality. So I'll get to that in a little bit. Let me talk about what I mean by declining consumption inequality. If we look today at what the rich and poor consume, rather than their income, we get a very different picture of what inequality might look like. And if you think historically for a minute, the difference between the rich and the poor was mostly that the rich could consume things that the poor could not. And I'm thinking here over the long history of humanity. Right? If you know Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you may remember the scene where the, how we know who the king is. I'm not going to use that word again. All right? uh, if you know that movie, right, you might remember that scene. That scene's actually you know, not inaccurate in the sense that in a world, that world, the difference between rich and poor was, was enormous. What I want to suggest is that we've gone from a world in which we had a small number of haves and a large number of have-nots to a world with a large number of haves and a small number of have-more and betters. And I think the kind of thing that, again, Bob Frank was talking about in his opening remarks uh, is, is consistent with this point, right? That the world we live in now, we tend to focus on those people at the top who are the have-more and betters. What I want to focus on for the next 12 minutes or so are the large number of haves and how much better off poor and middle income Americans are than they used to be and ask the question whether this doesn't represent a narrowing of consumption inequality. So for example, Bill Gates has a house with air conditioning and heat, running water, he has appliances and cars, he has <coughs> access to life-saving medical technology, all of the things that we think of that wealthy people in the United States have today. But you know what? The average poor American, it turns out, has most of those, if not all of those things, too. Though perhaps of lower quality and or fewer of them. Right? That the difference between rich and poor today is not a difference so much between have and have not, but more a difference between have and have better and more of them. Okay? So I want to give you some data to back that up in a second, but what I want to argue now is that the difference here is smaller than the difference between have and have not. It's a better society when our differences between lots of people having things and a few people having more of and better of those things versus a society in which a small number of people have things and a large number don't. 
the first society, again, a lot of us, all of us, I think, have done thought experiments tonight, but I think that first one is a better society to live in. So the question is why? How has this come about? Well, I think one reason for that is what we might call the declining real class of goods. And, and what I want to argue is that the story of the last 200 years is a story of the growing purchasing power of human labor and its spread from rich to poor. That is, first, it has been the wealthy who gained that purchasing power, and that purchasing power has slowly spread to the poor. And one way of, mentioning, well, one way of measuring that is by looking at what various goods cost when they're calculated in terms of the average hours at the average private the number of hours that the average private sector uh, hourly wage it takes to purchase them. This is an interesting way to calculate, and in fact we saw this again in Bob's opening remarks, with his rent measure, right? It was calculated in terms of work hours for, the, for median income. I want to look at that again, but I want to look at a whole bunch of other goods, and part of my argument would be by looking at those other goods, it might explain to us how we can afford some of the things that, that, that have, have, in fact, become more expensive. I also want to make a second point, too, Right here, that it may be that many of the one of the reasons that so many of these goods are now more affordable by poor Americans is because at first they were only affordable by wealthier Americans. It might be that one of the benefits of income inequality is that wealthier people can afford things first and make it possible for producers to invest in new and better goods that are very expensive at first but progressively become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. I'm old enough to remember the first so called pocket calculator. Right, in the 1970s, which cost about $75, took 14 batteries and barely fit in your pocket, and did about four things. Now, in our pockets, right, we have this, which costs, in terms of hours work, not all that much different from that pocket calculator did. And the pocket calculator, and by the way, it has a calculator on it, right? The pocket calculator is a giveaway, right? The bank or someone, you know, we get solar ones for free. Right? That decline, the fact that some people were able to afford those things first. Take the car example, right? Almost, well, most cars these days have now, the new cars they always have rear backup, rear view uh, cameras on them. That was once considered an element for rich people to have on their cars. The fact that some rich people were able to afford it and showed that they wanted it made it possible for firms to mass produce those in ways they might otherwise. And when we start to look at things this way, the vast majority of commonly first purchased household items are much cheaper than they used to be. And the result of that is, a, is the narrowing of consumption inequality between the rich and poor. So I'm going to run some data by you uh, to take a look at. The first set of data uh, is 20th data over the course of the 20th century, all right? and it runs from 1920 to 1997. And these are some basic household staple items, again, measured in terms of the hours that, the, that an American would, who was earning the average private sector wage, uh, industrial wage, manufacturing wage, would have to labor to buy those things. And you can see half gallon of milk, one pound loaf of bread, gallon of gas, air travel, all those things fell substantially in terms of the, number, the amount of time it took to purchase things over the course of the 20th century. And if you think about it for a moment, that time is important variably, right? The, more, the less time we spend working to buy these basic goods, the more time, the more money we have, right? The more of our hours are spent to earning income to buy the other kinds of things that we have. How is it that so many Americans can afford one of these? It's because we spend so much less of our income as a percentage of our income on these other kinds of things. If you look at shelter, clothing, and food, the average American family at the turn of the 20th century spent about 70, 75% of their income on shelter, clothing, and food. Today, it's about 35 to 37%. So again, that, that, the, the, the ability to consume with these goods are within reach of many more people than it used to be. This is the same data set. Uh, I just call your attention to the bottom line, the computing power of a million instructions per second. 1950 would have taken you 515,000 lifetimes to purchase that. Even by 1997, nine minutes, that's already, what, 20 years ago. Today, you know, we'd be talking seconds, if not fractions of a second. All of these goods, electricity, three pound chicken, fairly nice, all much cheaper than they used to be. If you think, if you want to look at some data that's a bit more recent, here's some data from the Sears catalog. Uh, from 1975 to 2006, very similar kind of data here, uh, looking at the number of hours it would take to buy those goods. One of the things I want to point out, uh, for example, with the uh, garage door opener here, one of the problems of making these comparisons over time is that goods have gotten so much better. That garage door opener in 1975, the cheapest one you could buy from Sears was a quarter horsepower. The cheapest one you could buy in 2006 was a uh, half horsepower. <coughs> so you might want to you know, adjust those figures for the fact that the one in 2006 is twice as powerful as the one in 1975. That point about quality is something, again, I want to come back to uh, in a minute. If we want to see even more recent data or sort of wider range of data than, of data than this, 
This is 1973 to 2009 data that's coming up in a second, and this is a bunch of, very, of household appliances. Uh, looking at the retail prices in 1973 at the average uh, private sector manufacturing wage of $4.12 an hour versus 2009. Like Nikolai, I tried to cut my data off before the effects of the Great Recession were, were there. Uh, 2009 just so happened to be a useful date, but again, uh, before things that, that happened since. And again, you can see hours of work at the then, at the 2009 uh, private sector uh, wage. If you look at that, the number of hours it takes, number of hours of work it, work it takes to purchase those goods has fallen dramatically. These are kind of basic household appliances that we think of as being staple goods for, for, for American citizens. has fallen by an average of about 71%. The point I want to make, though, is it's not just that these goods are cheaper. They're much better than they used to be. A color, I'm old enough to remember color TVs in 1973. If you were lucky, you had a 19-inch one. Right? And didn't normally would have a remote control. My remote control was I threw something at my brother to change the channel. Okay? All these other goods are more electric, more, more uh, efficient, uh, electrically efficient, energy efficient. They do a better job. The washing machine cleans your clothes better. The refrigerator keeps food better. All of these goods are better than they used to be. Coffee pots, but what? All of this. So even if we just look at price, we get one thing. But when we begin to look, include the quality measure in there, think of what a TV, a typical TV, looks like and does today. Right, again, much cheap goods are much cheaper. The result of the, of the fact that these things are much cheaper is they become much more affordable and accessible to poor Americans. My next set of data here is some household consumption data between 1971 and 2005, so essentially spanning a, that 30 year period that we've roughly been talking about. And I'm, when I flip in a second, you'll see down the left side, very similar list to what you just saw for the basic household goods. And then across the top is going to be the percentage of households among the poor and then among the average American, uh, typical American, all American households, who, who have those goods in their house in various years. Okay? So one of the things to notice, if you just look at the first four columns first, you can see that for poor, and this is not, by the way, the lowest quintile, this is below the poverty line, American households, poor, those poor American households have steadily increased their ability to consume those goods over the course of that 20-year stretch from 1984 to 2005. Uh, and you can notice a few things fell off, like uh, te telephones, for example. Why? Because now poor households are more likely to have cell phones than they used to, even as of 2005, which now we're talking 10 years ago. One quick story about cars. 72.8% of poor American households had a car in 2001. How many of you have either read or seen the movie or The Grapes of Wrath? Any? Awesome. Better than my liberal arts students at St. Lawrence. You are to be congratulated. Okay? You know the story, right? It's the story of an American family in the Great Depression who, who is caught up in the Dust Bowl uh, and heads to California, to, gets in their car, their beautiful car, and heads to California in search of a better life, and terrible things happen to them on the way, and it's a general indictment of American capitalism at the time. The Russians, the Soviets, decided to show the movie of Grapes of Wrath as propaganda uh, after, not long after it was made. And they had to stop after a small number of showings because the Russian people watching, watching the movie, at the end kind of said, wait a second, poor Americans have cars? Okay. So again, context does matter here. Right? And, and when we think, when we sort of recognize this question of consumption inequality, we begin to see some of these things in a different light. And again, as I emphasized at the beginning, I think that one of the reasons th that these goods are more available to poor households is because rich households are able to afford them first and justify the expense that producers take in producing it. Last point about this uh, table is you'll notice that the poor American households in 2005, on most of those goods, were more likely to have them in their house than were the average American family in 1971. And that suggests, again, that poor households are doing pretty well, right? In, and even in relative terms. If you compute, by the way, the sort of gap between poor households and rich households and the ownership of those goods, you'll see it shrinking. It doesn't, it doesn't shrink a lot because the numbers are pretty high, right? But it does shrink over this time, too, suggesting, again, a reduction in consumption inequality. So that, that's, with that, we might begin to think about some of these broader themes that we've been talking about. And I'm going to put to you what my friend Don Boudreau has put forward. I like to call it the Boudreau Challenge. That's an operating room from 1967. That's an operating room from 2000, uh, roughly 2013, 14, 15. And Don's challenge is the following. Given the choice, would you rather live in 1967 with today's real median household income of almost $52,000, or today with 1967's real median household income of $35,000? And 
Don's point here is to suggest that there's so many more things available to us today, so much more cheaply, that we might well be better off today with the lower median household income than we would have been in 1967 with the higher median household income. With all these basic goods of goods that weren't even available back then, like the stuff in our pockets or medicines and so forth, right? that in fact, even though we are caught up perhaps in these sort of spending uh, binges that, that, that Bob Frank is talking about, right? The world, that has also created a world in which if people are able, including the average American and poor Americans, to live better lives uh, than, they were, than they were in the past. Another way to look at this is the following. Uh, in 1964, the year I was born, the average hourly wage was $2.50. Now we get that same average private sector manufacturing wage. Today it's about 21. In 1964, suppose you wanted a home entertainment system. What would it look like? I don't know how well you can see that. A moderately priced, excellent stereo system, that's actually 63, would have cost you $379 in 1964. That would have been about 152 hours of work for the typical American to purchase that. And consider what you're getting, right? Not much. I, I used to have one of those. I know what they sound like. It's not much. All right. But now consider the following. That same 152 hours at $21 an hour today would be almost $3,200. If you wanted to, with $3,200, you could walk in, as of October, to Walmart and buy this. A GoPro, which is just, you know, if you need a GoPro. <laughs> and a 3D printer, so you can make the other stuff. <laughs> Add it all up, $3,200, right? And what I want to argue is that this remarkable expansion in, our, in, our consum in the consumption capacity of typical Americans is a great equalizer. So much stuff is so much cheaper that we're able to afford fancier weddings, bigger cars, bigger houses. Okay? And we can, I think it'll be an interesting discussion to think about how we want to contextualize that at consumption cascade. But perhaps one of the reasons we're able to do that is that all this other stuff has become more cheap. And as it has, the distance between rich and poor, in terms of what they're able to consume, and that's ultimately what matters, what one's able to consume, has narrowed, I think, substantially. So let me leave you, as all of us have, I think, with two questions. Uh, what exactly are the problems that supposedly growing income inequality is creating in a world where consumption inequality, I would argue, is shrinking, and the poor are doing better than ever? We heard some of the answers in, in, in uh, Joshua's talk, but I, and I think those are areas that we can continue can continue to talk about as we move this to a panel discussion. And finally, to what degree has the increased politicization of resource allocation that's taken place in the U.S. since 2008 led to a regressive redistribution of resources and power? Have bailouts and new regulations actually benefited the have more and betters and rather than the have nots? And maybe one reason we're seeing worsening income inequality over the last six or seven years is precisely because some of the things that we did in response to the Great Recession. And I'll, I'll close with, with well, I'll, actually, I'll leave it there. I'll save my last thought for, for the discussion. Thank you all very much. Do you have a question that you'd like to start with? A question. Uh, yeah, let, let me ask, uh, why is it relevant for our discussion of inequality to note that life is better today than it was in the feudal past? Is, isn't the real issue whether life would be better today if there were less inequality today. I, I certainly agree that life is better today than in the feudal past. I would rather live today than in the feudal past. But it's, it just seems uh, that no useful, purpose is, no useful purpose is served by having to spend three times as much to achieve a basic goal that could be achieved for a third as much. Uh, it's not a strange parent that wants the guests at their daughter's wedding to, to leave feeling like they had a good time and that the, the occasion was uh, suitably marked by the, the festivities, but 
to have to spend $31,000 to achieve that goal, when if everybody spent a third as much, we would achieve the goal equally well, that's just wasteful. Why do we want to do that? Whose freedom is enhanced by doing that? We have to tax something. Whose freedom is violated if instead of taxing income, we tax consumption at more steeply progressive rates and cut out some of that waste? So that's my question. Why can't we focus on making today better than about worrying about whether today is better than yesterday? I think the quick answer is that if many of the policies that we might undertake to level income inequality, even including a consumption tax, and again, I think that's not an in-principle objection to a consumption tax. It might be an objection to a steeply progressive one. But some of the policies we might undertake to reduce income inequality may have the effect of making it harder to produce the very goods that are making the lives of those at the bottom of the income distribution better off. If I didn't get that across clearly enough, that's my failing. But I think that when we think about income inequality, we, I think, also have to think about the ways in which the spending habits of the rich create, if unintentionally, the possibilities of improving life for the poor. And that's why I think looking at consumption inequality is ultimately what we want to do. I think one other quick point I'll make here is, you know, it may well, as Nikolai kind of hinted at, it may well exacerbate some of these problems. The policies we might adopt to cure these problems might well exacerbate some of them. And I think that's a serious consideration that we have to think about here. I'll leave it there. I'd like to give a half playful and half serious reply. And I say half playful because I haven't completely developed the theory yet. I think in a way we are returning to a medieval system of economics. Now, that may sound like a very silly and controversial statement, but I'm just going to give you two examples. If you think of the medieval system as a system where guilds restricted the ability of anybody to enter into a new profession, and basically what they were doing, basic economics, is limiting the supply to keep their wages up at the expense of other people who are not allowed to enter, that's essentially what we're seeing with these increased licensing requirements. Moving from 5% to 30% of jobs that require a license, basically saying, you know, we have cases, I'm just going to use the Louisiana case as an example. It is illegal in the state of Louisiana to sell flowers if you are not a licensed florist. Now, we all know how many people die every year because of improper flower arrangements, so it's good to know. You have to take classes, you have to pay for these classes, you have to take a written exam, and you have to put together two floral arrangements as judged by somebody who is currently a licensed florist in the state of Louisiana. And of course what they're doing is trying to keep other people out. So that's point number one. We have a return to a system where we have less and less economic freedom, and guess what? A lawyer is going to be able to pay for the bar exam. A lawyer is going to be able to pay for the professional license. Somebody with minimal skills is going to have a lot more difficulty entering into a profession and trying to compete in a profession that is closed. Second example, we're returning to the medieval idea of just price theory. As opposed to markets determining prices, people getting paid for the value of the marginal product of their labor, we have more and more of a push, and I think it comes from noble purposes, but I think there's also a public choice story that can be told, increasing minimum wages. $15 an hour, $20 an hour, $25 an hour. Sounds like a wonderful idea until you think that those who are not able to produce at that level are the ones who are likely to end up being unemployed. And it comes down to a philosophical question of what should determine the wages of people, whether it's some abstract outside notion of justice, and we abstractly say, well, okay, let's decide. $25 an hour, $50 an hour is the just wage, as opposed to focusing on letting markets determine the value of labor, and then maybe deciding instead of tinkering with minimum wage laws, let's look at ways in which we can enhance the human capital of the poorest in society so that they can earn more as opposed to being locked out of the system. One quick thing I want to add, one point that Bob Frank made, which is, yeah, no one's going to argue about the difference between a feudal society and today, but I'm much more interested in the question of the difference between the 1970s and today, because that's where the folks who are focusing on income inequality as such a problem start their own analysis frequently. And what I want to argue is if we look at consumption, we don't see the same growth in inequality. In fact, we see a reduction. John? Yeah, the question, Bob's question wasn't exactly for me, but I want to follow up that just to ask an even question related to that. I think everybody agreed. Hopefully, we're all, most of us are working really, really hard 
lots of us, and we're, we're generally hardworking people and we innovate. Hopefully, goods are getting cheaper. Hopefully, we're producing better goods more efficiently, right? Um, the question is, is the inequality contributing to that? You, you said a little bit about why. I, I, rem, I remain unconvinced, and the reason, a question that I have for you first, and I have all sorts of, I could open into all sorts of speech making right now, but my first follow-up question is, I mean, did we not, I mean, okay, so look at this way. Let's compare the 40 years we've been talking about, whether we talk about inequality or whatever, let's compare it to the previous 40 years, right? The previous 40 years, was a year, was a period where we had substantially more income inequality, hugely more wealth inequality, right? Where productivity gains translated to gains in wages, as opposed to there being a sharp separation, and there's, a, there's some legitimate debates about how sharp that separation is between, between, uh, between productivity and, and wages, but at the median level, it, there's no argument that it's not substantial, right? We had wide, broad-based growth. And not only, and this is sort of a response to Professor Wenzel as well, but not only that, um, we had greater growth in that period than we have in the 40 years since then. Now, of course, any 40-year slice is going to have all sorts of differences from any other 40-year slice, but it seems like, you know, textbook economic theory might tell us one thing, our actual data might tell us something else, and the actual data might be telling us that inequality is more efficient. Or excuse me, that inequality is more efficient. That inequality is not helping it, or to put it in terms of uh, Dr. Wenzel's, that the, 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 the choice between growth land and equality land might be a false choice. It might be the case that growth land looks a lot like equality land, depending on how you do it, but the same thing could be said about any decision that you make about how to structure markets, right? The, deep, the devil's in the details, but the, you, so far I haven't been given any reason to believe that the inequality itself is necessary for any of these things. In fact, I feel like there's a lot of data that says it's simply not necessary. Anyway, I don't know if you Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, there's, there's a lot there, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna make it all about my argument. But uh, I, a couple things I would say. One, when we look at the wages, the sort of stagnating wages and productivity question, I think we also have to look at two, two other things. One is not just wages, but total compensation. When you look at total compensation, that split is not as big as, 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 you, know, as you noted. So that's, that's one point I think to consider there. I think the other end of that is, is the question, that's why I'm concerned about consumption, which is what can people buy with their wages? If, if we have a situation, and it seems like we do, where we continue to produce stuff more cheaply, right, and better stuff more cheaply, then the fact that that wage growth or even compensation growth has not gone up as quickly as it did before uh, might not matter as much if the, those wages can buy more than they did before. And one of the things we have to think about in the last 40 years, two things. One is the sort of technological revolution that's driven down prices, but also the opening up of trade globally, right, is another big change in here too. That made it possible for people to consume more, perhaps with that, with that, with that slower growth. And we can, we can look at those slower growth and wages, but the fact is, in terms of consumption, I would argue we're doing better than we were before. Another, um, another answer I'd like to give to that, if we look at the period 1930 to 1970, um, versus 1970 to 2010, one of the things I emphasized in my talk is a massive expansion of the role of government in the economy as a whole. So the growth, if you divide government spending by total GDP, we've had an increase in that. So um, two problems there, which I think are actually increasing inequality. The first one is the welfare state. And if you look at the welfare state, even if it starts off with a good intention, the, the, uh, the way the welfare state at least has worked out in the U.S. is it allows more people to live without working. So that is going to increase inequality because it's not an investment in human capital. It's not an investment in the opportunity to earn more income, but it's simply an opportunity for more, as I pointed out, um, many people in the bottom 20% of income are not working today. So that is going to contribute to inequality. The second thing that we see is the growth of government also contributing to inequality because of that uh, redistribution effect that I talked about, not going from richer to poorer people, but going from more politically active and concentrated people um, to, uh, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, from the uh, concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. So the diffuse costs are paying and the money is going into the concentrated benefits. And if anything, what have we seen post-2007 is increasing inequality for the simple reason, how many of you here got a bailout? Well, 
it's the people at the top, in the top, um, in the top quintile that got the bailouts, and it wasn't those of us in the other quintiles who got the bailouts. So it seems to me that the more you have government intervention in the economy, the, as we've seen from 1970 to 2010, uh, compared to the 40 years before that, the more you have government intervention in the economy, the more you're rewarding government activity as opposed to economic activity, and this is where I think I agree with Professor Price, this is the difference between a well-functioning and a poorly functioning democracy. We have a poorly functioning democracy in the US. Increasing amounts of government uh, spending in the economy means that political activity or political connection is going to start being rewarded more than economic activity, and I think that's one of the things that we've seen. Why do we see more and more concentration of wealth at the top, in spite, you know, even though I said it wasn't necessarily that much of a problem. Why do we see more concentration at the top? Because precisely we have more government intervention in the economy, and it is those very people at the top who are able to capture the political process for their own gain, as opposed to the, those who are ignored in a, in a democracy and those who are ignored in a crony capitalist system that we currently have. Professor Frank? Can, can I just ask whether, whether you recognize having just made an argument against increasing inequality? If it empowers the people at the top to buy government favors so effectively, isn't that a bad thing? Well, the inequality comes from the expansion of government in the first place, is what I'm arguing. So, well, it may come in part from that, but you know, surely you don't think it comes only from that, or even mainly from that. And the other question I think is if it's if mainly we, market incomes, so I mean, pre-tax market incomes have grown vastly more disparate in the last 40 years. It's not mainly from government favors that that's happened. Dentists, on average, earn about what they did 40 years ago, but the top 1% of dentists earn five or six times as much as they did then. That's not government largesse, that's just a winner take all market. You know, one practice emerges as the go-to cosmetic dentistry practice everywhere. Whoever started that practice and built the reputation of being the best, that absorbed a few other practices, and then all the money goes there. But then those winners have the capacity to buy favors from government, and we, I think we can all on this panel agree that buying favors from the government is a bad thing. But it's, it's a bad thing that's absolutely abetted by the patterns of income change that we've been seeing. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. I got to you. Now, my second one's a question for you, Josh, anyway. So all right. um, I, I, think, I think the one response to that argument, though, is that that's precisely the reason why it, why one wants to keep the other, there's plenty of other reasons I think it's a good idea, but why one might want to keep the size of the state to the minimal amount necessary, right? If the fact is that, that the rich will always gain power over the political process, there's two ways to deal with that. One, you can try to use more government power to decrease inequality, or you can argue government should be doing less, and therefore the, the, those with money will have less opportunity to make use of that power for their own purposes. And that kind of leads to my question for Josh, which is, uh, it, it, it's, I think it is true that economic inequality can lead to political inequality in the way you talk about. But the question then becomes, what, doesn't that make us skeptical of using more government as a way to address economic inequality? Because isn't it, don't, shouldn't we then think that the things that government's going to do are going to mostly rebound to the, to the benefit of those who already have the means? They're the ones with the access to political power. Um, Are, aren't we stuck in a kind of loop? How do we get out of that loop? Um, well, uh, I guess I'll answer the question first. And then, then my first question is, I, I, insofar as I can tell, no one on this panel is advocating for more government. Um, I, I, don't, I certainly heard that in Bob's opening remark. Well, I think what we've been advocating What did you hear me say that made it sound like I wanted more government? I, I if not, if government not more, at least more, at least more spending on Bob's roads I'm driving on. <laughs> well, you might want more spending on potholes too, but I mean, the more government, less at least in this group, the, and I think I don't even just think in this group. I think for almost any participant in this discord, the the more government, less government question is almost completely a hollow. One. The question is overwhelmingly which forms of government how, right? And what. You know, I haven't talked too much about concrete policy here deliberately because of the nature of my talk and what I wanted to set up here. Uh, Professor Frank has done that uh, some and done well in his books and, of course, in, in his brief presentation here. But, I mean, I, I don't think we should have licensure for florists. 
That's, that's clearly an I don't obvious think we should either. Um, you know, like there's all sorts of problems with that, right? I don't think we should have marijuana be illegal. There's all that, which means now I can't run for public office for 10 years, but I don't think that, but then it'll change. But I don't think that should be illegal. Um, there, there's all sorts of ways in which government can be part of the problem. But there's two things worth noting. One thing worth noting is, is that governments are, first of all, at some level, essential for structuring markets, but to put it, whether they are or not, well, they are, but I mean, like, the degree to which they are is a matter of debate. However, what is not a matter of debate that, is that governments are involved in markets. Our question is, how should governments be involved in markets? Our answer, Bob and I's answer, is that they should be involved in ways, as best they can, to ameliorate inequality, right? That that's a central question. Um, I want to have a sort of, so, uh, so. And another way of putting it is that even if you agree, and this is why, I mean, I, I have, as I said, I have a forthcoming paper uh, in basic income studies on Milton Friedman on freedom. I said, even if you think that Friedman's right, even if you think that the ideal state is a state with, you know, regulated by a constitutional provisions for markets, even if you think that generally for public choice sounding reasons, democracy is not all that good, but you still have to have democracy to settle the rules of the game, right? Even if you just believe that, you have to deal with, in the status quo, the impact of inequality on the inst laws and institutions, right? You can't ignore that inequality. That inequality is part of the problem for why government is maybe, is or is not doing what it should be doing in markets. In other words, it's another, another that's a really long way of putting it, inequality is a major problem, right? And that's one reason why, and one reason that I think we can all agree to. Uh, can I have a follow-up question for, sure, for, uh, for Professor Wetzel, too? Yeah. You'll, you'll have to do some more work to convince me that the welfare state is causing more poverty. I think you're going to have to do a, a lot of work on that. I mean, you know, I say we should look at empirical reality rather than so-called textbook economic theory, whatever. But, but it seems to me that if you undercut the bargaining power of the poorest members of the population, that you're going to undercut the bargaining power of the people right above them as well. And it seems to me that workfare programs, right, I, I'm all about investing in human capital. My, my way of orienting to justice is broadly relational egalitarian, but it has equal opportunity, responsibility, sensitive <coughs> qualities. But, uh, but it seems to me that if you undercut the bargaining power of the poorest population by, by lowering the floor to zero, that essentially you're going to undercut the bargaining power of the next group above them, and that there will be, that if, if anything, getting rid of a high floor will make it more rather than less likely to have inequality. Or poverty. One quick thing I would say. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that, you, that both you and Bob have talked about, that, and I can't, I'm not going to speak for Nick, I'll speak for me too, for myself rather, is uh, the idea of a basic income or some kind of negative income tax, one of those kind of proposals, certainly for me, is much better than the status quo. And if that's what we're talking about in terms of, if that's the way we're going to ameliorate inequality, that's certainly better than a welfare state that spends way more money and actually gets into the hands of poor people. So if that's what, if we want to talk about, again, and I would talk about it not so much in terms of inequality, but as a way of addressing making sure that poverty isn't, isn't as damaging as it might otherwise be. And that's, I think, an interesting conversation that we might want to have. But when you say ameliorate inequality, I need to know what, what that role of government would be. We can talk about things that government maybe shouldn't do, like you know, uh, license florists, but we need to be more concrete about what it means to do that and what kinds of, what sorts, I mean, we have the idea of a higher consum progressive con consumption tax, but where's that money going to go? What's it going to be spent on? What are the, you know, what are the things that, that it means to ameliorate inequality? We, don't, we don't, maybe don't want to get too caught up in the thickets of particular, but I think for, for where I'm coming from, knowing what the concrete answers to that question is matter a lot, because those are things that are going to matter for the level of growth and the way in which that growth affects the, the absolute well-being of least well off. Yeah, and I wanted to add to that. Um, I think the welfare state really has increased the level of inequality because it hasn't focused, as I mentioned, on increasing the human capital, the poorest elements in society. I don't think it's the welfare state alone uh, that has increased poverty in the U.S. What is what is causing the increase in poverty is the, the tangle of regulations that we have that make it so difficult for the poorest elements of society to enter into the job market. So if there's a $10 per hour minimum wage or $15 per hour minimum wage, anybody whose uh, value of labor is worth more than $15 an hour is not going to be affected by the minimum wage. Those who are going to be affected by the minimum wage are those who are worth less.
than $15 per hour in the job market. I'm reminded here of a story, um, and I think this, this ties in with this. Um, Walmart, uh, which is a, a company that all of you have followed, I think, for its very progressive policies on workers, uh, for the benefits that it gives to workers, for the high wages that it pays to work. We're not talking about the same Walmart. They're not laughing. They're not laughing. Walmart, for a decade or so now, has been lobbying the federal government to make it mandatory for employers to pay for health insurance for their employees. Now, why would Walmart do something like that, given its reputation and given its other record? It has made the calculation that on a per worker basis, it is going to be hurt less than Target, which is its next, next biggest competitor. So it has been pushing for these regulations because it understands that it can weather the storm better than Target can, and therefore is in favor of this. Take a second example that's, that's parallel to this, the 2010 Dodd-Frank Dodd Act, which was designed to end the notion of too big to fail. So if my favorite sandwich shop fails, I cry in my corner, but I'll, I'll, I'll live. But if a big bank fails, it could bring the rest of the economy tumbling down with it if, the, if businesses can no longer get short-term loans, if um, uh, depositors have difficulties, et cetera. So Dodd-Frank was designed to uh, re-regulate or add regulations to the financial markets to prevent too big to fail. Now what happened, of course, is that the regulations on a per unit basis were more expensive for smaller banks and bigger banks. So what we've seen over the past six years is a greater concentration in the banking industry, which is exactly the opposite of what Dodd-Frank intended to do. So my concern with all this, I don't, I don't think the welfare state alone is to blame for the, um, it certainly hasn't diminished poverty in the United States, but I don't think the welfare state alone is to blame. It's this mass of regulations, which may be either, depending on the removed that day, they may be either well-meaning, but ignoring the laws of economics so they lead to bad results, or maybe they are not well-meaning, because I certainly don't think Walmart is well-meaning in trying to drive um, target out of business and, and hiding behind the veil of mandatory health insurance. I think it's this morass of laws that, and regulations that are supposed to, on paper, be helpful for the poor, but end up hurting the poor. Why don't we open it up now to audience Q&A. We can, of course, continue this conversation, but I'd like to get some audience participation. Um, if you can, we have two microphones, one on this side and one on this side, and I will alternate between the two. So feel free to line up between whichever one you'd like. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so two questions. One is I'd like to hear from each of the panel what you take to be the causes of the growth in income inequality. So I have an idea what Professor Wesley might say because he cited government. But in the same period, there were all sorts of changes. Globalization, uh, dumping a lot of money to higher education, um, technology, and so forth, which might benefit some and exclude others from the growth. So there's this interesting question about what each of you, whether you're on the same page at all, about what the causes are of the increase in inequality. And then the second question is just looking at GDP. So just total social wealth. Is there empirical evidence that reducing or increasing inequality has an impact upon GDP? So that if you say efforts to decrease inequality would disincentivize production, therefore dampen GDP growth, or is it the other way around? You, I don't know. So I'm curious about if there's any empirical evidence. So it's two questions, I'm sorry. But yes. Bob, go first. Yep, Bob, do you want to go first? Yeah, what was the first question again? The, I'll take the second one. Does, does uh, reducing the variance of incomes help GDP grow faster or does it inhibit growth? I think the, the conventional view at one time was that it inhibits growth. Uh, the, the, everybody accepts the idea that incentives matter and the idea seems to follow that if your after-tax wage goes down, your incentive isn't to work as hard and so the economy won't grow as quickly. Uh, if you look a little more closely, though, that's never been a prediction of economic theory. Uh, a reduction in the wage rate has two effects. It does make it cheaper to take time off. That's the one everybody focuses on when they say people won't work as hard. But it also makes you poorer, and that's uh, an effect in the opposite direction. Which of those two effects dominate is a strictly empirical question. And what we know from the historical data is that 
the real wage now is much, much higher than it was 100 years ago, and people on average work much, much less than they used to. So it's precisely the opposite of the conventional view. If you pay people more, they'll work harder. You do need to pay people more if they work harder than if they don't work as hard. So the slope of income with respect to effort can't be zero. Everybody will stay home and veg out if you do that. But the evidence seems to suggest that people want to get ahead. Getting ahead is a quintessentially relative concept. So if the tax rate at the margin is 33 percent, 28 percent, 56 percent, it just doesn't seem to matter very much. There are 40 vice presidents who all want to be CEO, and that's going to be true. They're going to work their asses off whether the tax rate is 30 percent or 80 percent. The second question was... Yeah, what was the first question? I mean, the first question was what caused the acceleration in inequality since 1970? Well, I have a dog in that fight. Phil Cook and I argued it was the power of information and other technology to extend the reach of the most able performers. You know, we don't need millions of local tax accountants. Now somebody competes to write the most user-friendly tax software. There are hundreds of programs. The critics anoint one of them the best, and then that's the only one we need anymore. And so the developers of that program get very, very rich, and a lot of local accountants earn a lot less money than they used to. It's that story in one form or another replayed in almost every sector. I'll just add a couple quick points to that last comment. I think there's some truth to that. The question is whether those same processes haven't benefited consumers immensely, those same information technology processes that have enriched some people. Sure, sure they have. Yeah, and I think we have to do double-entry bookkeeping here. I also think globalization has been key to this too, right? The stakes, for example, see, you know, if you have a globalized economy, the value that shareholders might and boards of directors might believe that, rightly or wrongly, that CEOs can deliver is much higher and will be able to pay them more. And so I think that's part of that process too. I'll add something. I mean, well, I think winner take, I mean, I'm not the economist here, so you can, I guess, just clubber your ears and do the na-na-na. He did Rawls, you can. Yes. You'll do it better than I did Rawls. Professor Frank's winner take all economy book, well worth reading. I think he's definitely on to something. I think the bargaining power in general of labor vis-a-vis capital has dramatically decreased. Globalization is one of the sources of that. I don't think it's the only source of it. I think a major, major institutional source for growing inequality has been the cut in the marginal tax rate at the top level. Um, I think that that incentivized CEO pay to, to explode on top of where it was. Uh, two generations ago, there used to be, a, used to be the case that the average CEO would make three to five times, uh, maybe 10 times the average, and I guess I'm, I'm you know, uh, you know, just coming up with numbers, relatively speaking, the average worker, now it's closer to 20 to 100 to 500 times. A big reason of that is because those dollars aren't being taxed anymore. Um, and not taxing them or taxing them in the way that we do, we have started to tax them, meaning and one, of the, one of the implications is being able to avoid those taxations has, has given further incentive to this escalating rise in pay. It's very much, there's definitely a policy source to some of these inequalities. It's not just these natural products, if you will, of markets. PJ. Sure. Um, I had a question for Mr. Horowitz. Um, when describing or trying to illustrate declining consumption inequality, uh, you uh, had a list of select few commodities there and uh, noted the differences or the changes in uh, percentages owned among lower quintile people. Um, I would argue, or could you say that those kind of, or those increases in consumption would be due to increasing consumption pressures from higher classes? Um, I would argue that those commodities now are almost necessary for people in these times. Um, yes, more lower quant or quant quintile people have washers and dryers and phones and computers, um, but that's because if they want a job, their employers expect them to be able to be communicated to reliably and look nice and things like that. Um, and I think, <clears throat> to illustrate your point maybe a little better, you should look at more luxury goods, um, such as, you know, Obviously, more lower point people aren't hiring pet sitters and chauffeurs, you know, and stylists and things like that. So, 
I just wonder why that those select few commodities are listed those three points. I think just because there well two reasons. One, that's what the Census Bureau measures those for one thing, but they're they're pretty much household basics and they're things that are fairly constant over time that we can make those longitudinal comparisons. But having said that, right, I do think you know if you look at the kinds of things that even average and, and working class households are able to do today more frequently than they were in the past. Households eat often, eat out more often than they did in the past. They can afford to do that and so on. So perhaps one of the reasons we do we see this. I mean, you can say that there's pressure from above to consume these goods. But you still have to have the means to do it, right? And, and they still have to be affordable enough for you to get them. And there's no evidence, by the way, that this is being financed by any larger debt burden on households in terms of their level of debt compared to their income. So, I mean, it may be true. I mean, I, I'm not denying that people respond to the context and the social pressures that are around them. But to be able to, if you're going to respond, be able to respond, you have to have the means to do it. And what, I want, what my argument is is that when we, when we look at what the real ability of people to consume is, uh, we, we see less inequality than we have in the past. Court? Uh, my question is for Mr. Frank here, and it was also partially mentioned by Dr. Wenzel, but it was going into your specific idea on the new idea of income tax, and specifically taxing consumption. I was really intrigued by the idea. I haven't heard of it before, and I thought it was really interesting and neat when I first heard it. But the more I thought about it, I came to the idea of one concern I had for it, which is the fact that that tax idea kind of, it gives an incentive to people who save and don't spend their money. And when we're spending money, we're reinvesting our money into the economy. And if we're giving incentives to save and not spend, I was just wondering if you had any ideas on how if we implemented a tax policy like that to make sure that investment didn't severely decline because of it because that could possibly cause, you know, like nationwide economic there. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, we certainly would not have wanted to implement a progressive consumption tax right when the economy crashed in 2008. Uh, as long as there's insufficient demand in the economy, uh, it's any port in a storm. Any extra spending you can get from any quarter is better than none. And so uh, cutting back on consumption spending would be counterindicated during a demand shortfall economy. Absolutely. Uh, probably our best bet would be to vote such a tax into law with the proviso that will adopt it when the unemployment rate goes down uh, to a certain threshold that we all agree we're willing to call full employment. And at that point, it would be phased in gradually. That would actually accelerate the, the growth of the economy to full employment because rich people would hustle to build additions onto their mansions before the tax took effect, and we'd get a, an avalanche of additional demand, none of it on the government budget. So, so yes, if you phased it in gradually, you'd see a, a gradual shift from consumption, which is now about 70% of total spending, 66 to 70%, you'd see a gradual shift down in that, that percentage and a gradual shift up in the percentage of money spent on private investment and on public goods and services. Uh, we have a $3.6 trillion backlog of basic infrastructure maintenance. There's really no uh, need to go prospecting uh, in great depth to figure out what we might spend money usefully on. I mean, there's just so many essentials that we've postponed spending money on that if we had additional investment funds to, to make use of, we could put them to really good uses. Uh, I, I'd be curious to know whether all four of us would be willing to vote for a strict campaign finance measure that would uh, reduce the likelihood that any extra tax revenue would be funneled off into the, the pockets of the rich people who made big contributions to politicians. Do you want to? Just a quick comment. I think, again, I think it's, it's interesting when we look at, when, when the conversation has been often about government's inability to create streets that don't have potholes in them, 
that we believe if we have all, if we have all these things to do, that politicians will actually do the things that we think they should do. I'm much more skeptical of that, and I'm much more likely to believe that, in fact, it will be funneled off into the hands of the people who are, who are their cronies. I don't think campaign finance laws are going to stop that. If you want... Well, we know there are countries that have good governments. Yeah. Uh, if you want my to... wife's a city councilwoman in Ithaca. We have a good local government. It's, yeah. a, it's a treat to watch those smart people think hard about what, what policies to vote for. They, they've uh, really made life exist at a much higher quality as a result of the thoughtful efforts they put in. Well, uh, are, are there bad governments? There are plenty of them. But yeah. if we work hard, we could build a better government. I, I, and I, and if, and I'm much, I'd be much happier in a world where much more responsibility was at the local level in the way that you're talking about. But, but my, the, 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 so I, I, it's not, my, my point is simply, if, do we, how much confidence do we have that, 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 those, that governments will do the things that we say on the blackboard that they should do? And if you want to take money out of politics, get politician, that's politicians out of other people's money. Well, do you think that we'd have better roads, though, if we didn't collect taxes? I, I, think, I think, no, I think the argument instead is if, if we had ways of ensuring that government wasn't doing many of the other things it does, it would be easier to focus on the things, on the, the, the set of things that we think it should be doing. But right now, we have unconstrained politicians who are going to be bought off by the people who, by the, by the winners, right? And, and until we address the structural problems in terms of the, the relationship between the political realm and the, and the economic realm, that's going to continue to be the place and to, to be the, the situation. And to think that somehow we're just going to, we're going to get the policies out of this process that we might ideally wish to have, I'm not confident. But no one here thinks that, right? I mean, well, you're not really addressing, you know, anyone on this panel on that issue. I mean, right? I mean, the, the you know, the question is, I think everyone on this panel probably thinks the government should be in the business of, of, of building roads, and we generally think that government should be the, would do better at building roads if it did better at building roads, if it had better government. If, right? One of the questions, what our panel is discussing, though, is whether inequality helps or harms this process. And I think what Professor Frank and I have both argued and I think reasonably well, but you can judge, everybody can judge, is that inequality hurts that process rather than helping it. It, it hurts, it hurts it. The question is what to do about it. And if you think, my, my concern is that, if, that the, the solution to the problem you're identifying can go one of two ways. We can try to reduce inequality through the various measures that you're suggesting, or we can reduce the power of government so that those, so that, that inequality doesn't turn into political power, especially if you think that a society in which, which we have more restricted government would be one in which generates more wealth and that in turn benefits the people as a whole, particularly the least well off. Michael? Um, my question is mainly for Professor Price, for anyone who's welcome to weigh in. So in your main presentation, one of your main points was that economic quality is, is bad because it harms the, the political process, harms democracy. Um, making the connection between economic inequality and political inequality. Um, and I'm not entirely sure that connection is entirely there. I know, for example, literature, uh, 2003 article, um, interesting title, Why Is There So Little Money in U.S. Politics? Um, and uh, by, I'm going to butcher these names, but Anne Silberry, Figueredo, and Snyder, um, basically one of their arguments is that, so, Granted, it's 2003, so it's a, it's a pre-Citizens United world. But that in 2000, the total contributions to all politicians, 2000 election, every, every level, state, local, presidential, was about $3 billion. The federal budget for that year was about $2 billion, was about $3 billion was about $2 trillion. trillion. Uh, around that time, Nike spent like $10 billion to control an in industry that's only worth $40 billion. And so I think the argument that political, that economic quality has to uh, cause, economic quality has, economic inequality has to cause political equality has to do with viewing um, campaign contributions of, as investment, that corporations mainly think they're going to invest a bunch of money so that they'll get favors, government favors out of it in the end. But um, mentions, the, 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 the term they use is a uh, two-lock puzzle. Where if that is true, um, then the rate of return that they're getting on their contributions is astronomically high. 
and that they should really be re willing to spend more, and that it makes more sense to view campaign contributions as consumption, um, what was the term? Uh, consumption uh, valued with valued association with politics. That, and also mentioned that the vast majority of that three billion, two point four billion, came from individuals who only gave about one. Uh, 150 dollars, which makes sense because they figure they're not going to get much out of it. They're just individuals; they can't do much on their own. Um, and so that arguing that instead of thinking of contributions, con campaign contributions as as investment, as um, that we're going to give you this money, you're going to give us something back in return. That it's more just consumption. That they, that individuals who are the main people that give to democracy, which also I think kind of undermines that argument that it's not mainly corporations, it's mainly individuals who are giving to political contributions. Um, that it's they're giving mainly for the some for the reason that you would give to say like a charity that they're interested in politics, they're interested in the goal, and they don't feel they're going to get anything out of it in the end. But it's it's just consumption and not really investment. So I'm. I guess my main problem with your presentation is you kind of asked us to assume this connection exists, and I think that's a really strong claim to make. No surprise. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I haven't read that book. I do recall reading a footnote about it. Um, what's interesting about that, several things are interesting about that thesis. First of all, I, I would be inclined to say the thesis probably could use some updating with some trends. Um, but whether. My concern, a little bit, what also is interesting about that thesis is it seems to say that the politicians are doing better than the people on my left would think they are at making laws that are not being just crony capitalists, right? It's, a, it's a, essentially a thesis against crony capitalism, right? Or that, that that's not what's going on. Um, so I'm certainly not gonna, well, anyway. But, uh, but from my perspective, you know, it's certainly it's a problem if government just becomes, as everyone on this panel is concerned with, if governments can just be bought for special, particular market interests is a problem for everybody. But for a number of conceptions of democracy, maybe just the ones you have in the room, even if I was particularly benevolent, I had no, my, 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 even if uh, Bill Gates, even if Mark Zuckerberg um, is not selfish at all about his tendency, we might still think it's a problem that Mark Zuckerberg can tremendously impact policy in a way that most citizens can't. Regardless of whether he's buying Facebook favors or he's just or he's just making the policy fit his interest, they might both be a problem, right? Crony capitalism is one problem, but it's not the only problem. Another problem, again, it depends on what you think about democracy, why you think it's important, uh, what do you think it means to be a citizen. There's all sorts of questions lurking there. But on most conceptions of that, that kind of unequal influence might be a problem even if the people who are, even if CEOs were benevolent, right? Even if we imagine that, you know, we imagine, you know, we, it'd be wrong to think that the government agents are just benevolent. Probably be wrong to think that CEOs are just benevolent, but even if they were, democratic inequality might be a problem. Professor Cole, last question. Uh, we've focused tonight on the United States, the inequality in the United States. So I was wondering if, uh, if we're less parochial and look at the bigger context of the world, in which there seems to have been great advances in democratization in the same period, the growth of a, of a, in the mic, the a middle class of about 300 million in China was created over the same period. So that if you take, so I'm just wondering, if you take the global perspective, Maybe there's a local aberration in the United States where you get one sort of change in inequality and you get another change that's, that's a much more interesting one on a global scale. I wonder, I'm going to start with a speculation. I'm going to guess that China has much greater inequality now than it did 30 years ago because if you look at it, basically everybody except for the party apparatchiks um, was poor. And Today, as one portion of the population has become middle class. Who I think China even has more billionaires than the U.S. does. I, I could be wrong on that. They're all sending their kids to school in yeah. the United States. Um, well, at the same time, their uh, gov our democratic government's way better. Than that. Uh, well, at the same time, there's still a huge portions of the Chinese population that have not had access to that growth, in part because talk about crony capitalism. That's basically what's going on there. Um, so. 
I don't think we can say that the situation today with more inequality is worse than the situation 30 years ago when everybody was poor. That's why I say I'm still having difficulty with this notion that inequality is the fundamental problem. I'll just a quick point to add is that I think actually, I'm not sure it's an aberration or different, right? I mean, I think one of the trends we've seen globally recently is the dramatic decline in, in the number of people living on a dollar a day or two dollars a day. And we've seen a tremendous in, in, increase in well being there, and certainly the rise of China and India uh, and the rising living standards there and uh, have, you know, are, 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 I think, a good, are the good news. Um, it, you know, we have seen some increase in inequality as part of that, but as Nikolai suggests, right, um, it, you know, that inequality may be part of the very same pro the very same processes that produce better lives for the least well off may also produce growing inequality, and, and I think globally that may be what we're seeing. But but that's a, I'm willing to make that if if that's this, if that's the cost of many fewer people living on a dollar or two dollars a day, it's well worth paying. Bob, do you want to get in? I think the overall trend of the data is that within almost every country, inequality has been growing over the last decades, but that inequality between countries has been declining. Yep. So that's the good news about inequality in recent years, is the cross-country comparisons are getting a little less one-sided. Yep. Okay. Do you want to? Not on, not on this one. See if there were any. How much more time do we have? This, this, this is it. This is your last chance. This is your last chance. If you want to <laughs> close with one little comment. So sure. I, I tend to agree with um, my esteemed colleague, Professor Price, that inequality may indeed um, hurt democracy. But it seems to me every policy I ever hear to diminish inequality is just going to lead to greater inequality. Because the policies that lead to inequality are going to lead to more governmental intervention. And back to this process of crony capitalism, I'm not going to labor that. I want to return to a point that Professor Frank made at the beginning, which um, has troubled me, N not because he made the point, but because of the implications of the point. Um, the good schools are in the good neighborhoods. So as the price of housing goes up, de facto the price of schooling goes up. And that's probably going to lead to greater inequality because wealthier people are able to send their children to wealthier schools. Is that a problem fundamentally with inequality or with the model of funding that we have? where schooling is tied to geography as opposed to schooling tied either, if you want to get really crazy about it, some sort of a market system, or if you want to get less crazy about it, a voucher system where each family is handed a voucher to purchase education that is not linked to the place where they are. And that could, again, that might be an opportunity not just to break inequality, but to break poverty. So I'm wondering if there's not a question of um, inequality being Again, the wrong problem on which to focus, rather than some of the fundamental institutions underlying it. So, I think maybe I inadvertently closed with a question for Professor Frank in the process of thanking him for that comment. Would you like me to have, have him answer it, or just wanted to take the question? Uh, if uh, the good professor is willing to well, comment, would you like, would like to answer? So, we can give him the last word. Yeah, you have the last word, Professor Frank. Well, what, what's true is that uh, if we fund the school budget with property taxes, that really compounds the link between school quality and the average price of the house in the neighborhood. Uh, but even if you go to countries where, by law, the budget's the same at every school everywhere in the country, France has a requirement of that sort, still the, the schools that everybody would like to see their kids go to are in the more expensive housing areas. And that's going to be true even if, if uh, you take every equalization step possible just because the, the children of affluent families just start with a, a, a more prepared baseline when they enter kindergarten or even preschool. And so the pace of learning is going to be quicker in those neighborhoods. You, you can't eliminate that. The, the frustration, I think, that the middle income family experiences because of that link is that if you're the median earner, you're not going to adopt a goal, I, I, I hope my kids can go to bottom quartile schools. That's just not a realistic uh, portrait of parental human nature. You're going to want to at least claim your spot in the income distribution in terms of where your kids end up in the school quality distribution. And, and that just leads inevitably to this cascade where everybody spends more Bidding, trying to outbid other families for a house in a better school district, but just exactly 
as when everybody stands up to see better, nobody gets anything from that. So you just succeed at the end of the day in bidding up the prices of the houses in the better school districts. Half of all the kids end up going to bottom half schools the same as before. That's wasteful. All right. I'd like to give a round of applause to our panel.